Back in church, the best place on earth. Amen. Acts chapter number two. Acts chapter number two. <clears throat> The Holtons are back. Praise the Lord. Acts chapter number 2. Look at verse 41. Then they that gladly received this word. That's how to receive the word of God. Receive it gladly. Amen. They that gladly received this word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now you think about that for just a minute. My brother, what kind of impact could we have on our county if 3,000 people got saved in one shot? Can you imagine that? I, I, I can't, <laughs> you know. I mean, I've been on the mission field. I've seen, uh, I've been in meetings where we saw, uh, um, you know, we're not into the numbers thing and all this, but uh, I was, we preached in a meeting one time and where we had 50 people make, over 50 people make a profession of faith. And some of them stuck. And to me, that was amazing to see that many people respond to the gospel call. But could you imagine 3,000? And we're not just talking about 3,000 professions, empty professions of faith. As we read on, we're going to see these 3,000, not only did they trust Christ, they got baptized and they were added to the church at the same time. They got the real deal. 3,000 got the real deal in one shot. That's amazing. That's powerful. What kind of an impact did that make in Jerusalem to see 3,000 lives changed in one shot? Verse 42. To prove to you that they got the real deal, look at verse 42. And they continued, notice, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. That's how you know when you got the real deal because you'll come back. And you'll keep going back. You'll keep going back. I got to get some more. Just give me some more of that. Give me more of that Bible. Give me more of that fellowship. Give me more of Jesus Christ. So they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And in breaking of bread. Boy, they must have been Baptists. In breaking of bread and in prayers. They even showed up for Wednesday night prayer meeting. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need, and they, notice, continuing, continuing daily with one accord, in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as such a should be saved. So 3,000 get saved on the day of Pentecost. And then every day after that for some time, Souls just kept getting saved on a daily basis. You talk about revival. How powerful was the church in Jerusalem? I'd like to talk to us tonight on the subject of what the church of old had that we, that we need today. What the church of old had that we need today. Brethren, when I read about the great impact, and listen, uh, look at, if you will, in chapter, go to chapter 4 to show you how much this thing just continued to grow. Look at how much of an impact the church of Jerusalem was making in their area. Look at Acts chapter 4 in verse number 4. This thing just kept on growing. 
<laughs> and there was persecution. If you want to look at verse 1, and as they spake unto the people, the priests, and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Well, my goodness, you're not going to preach and see that much fruit and there not be some, some, some opposition. The enemy is going to get upset. If you can't handle and accept the fact that there will be opposition, then you're not gonna you're not gonna make it in the work of the Lord. But they just kept preaching. They kept preaching. Verse three, and they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now even tied. How be it? Look at verse four. Many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men were about five thousand. This thing is multiplying. And you read several times in the book of Acts, it says, and the, and the word of God grew and multiplied. Now that's what we desire. That's what we want for Calvary Baptist Church. We, wanna, we want the Lord to work in this place and through this place in such a way that we make such an impact in our town that the word of God grows and multiplies for the glory of God. So if we're going to be a church like that, we're going to have to go to the Bible. And we're going to have to look at the churches of old that God used in a mighty way and find out what was it about those churches? What was it about those Christians of yesteryear? Why was it that they were able to do like the King James Bible said, uh, they turned the world upside down? Man, they had such a great impact. Thousands were getting saved. Man, boy, I want to be a church member of a uh, part of a church like that where God is working in such a way that souls are getting saved and lives are being ch uh, changed and transformed. Jesus Christ is being glorified. What was it about those old Christians? The old school, the old guard. What was it about? The churches, man, uh, I love to read church history. I love to read about the old missionaries, the old time missionaries, the old time preachers and the things uh, that they experienced and the fruit that they saw in their ministries. My goodness, my brethren, uh, I, I like reading about them, brethren, and, and, and I want to find out what was it about them that made them so influential that they had such an impact like they did. We see so many changes nowadays going on in churches boy it's getting harder and harder to find a good bible believing church i mean i'm talking about harder and harder and i've been in churches all across uh the united states i've been in over 200 of them and uh, i'm just telling you my brethren it's it's getting scarce out there it's getting scarce that's why the church needs to do everything that it can to, to strengthen the things that remain. Because I'm telling you, our communities need churches just like this one, where the word of God continues to be taught and the gospel is preached because the gospel, the true gospel of Christ is not preached everywhere where, where there's a church, a so-called church. We need churches like this one to continue on for the glory of God that the gospel may continue to go forth. What was it about the church of old that made them so powerful? Uh, look at uh, Acts chapter 4. We're there already. Look at verse 31. Look at how powerful this church was. And when they had prayed, they're just having prayer meeting. And when they had prayed, notice, the place was shaken where, where they were assembled together. When was the last time you, you went to Wednesday night Prayer meeting, and you had a church service like that. They had one like that. It says uh, that the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness, and the multitude of them, of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the, uh, of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things common. And with great, notice, with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. That's what we want. That's what every church ought to desire. What was it? What did those churches of old have that we need today? Number one, they had an unction of the Lord. 
They had the power of God. Churches nowadays are going so worldly. They're changing. They're changing their doctrine. They're changing uh, their music. They're changing their Bibles. They're changing their standards. They're changing everything uh, that they used to stand for. And they're doing their best to look more and more like the world every day. I read a statement here recently by a, a, an old time preacher named G. Campbell Morgan. He said the church did more for the world when it was less like the world. But nowadays, churches are trying their best to imitate the world as much as possible. Let's, let's make the church look more and more like a rock and roll concert. There's contemporary movement in our churches nowadays. I'm against it 100%. There's neo-evangelicalism. And, and let me tell you what it's all about. They're getting the machines in there. They get the, the smoke machines. I've seen it. They're getting the smoke machines in there. Uh, I was asked uh, by a, a preacher. Brother Kenny knows him. His name is Tom Brennan. He's an author. He, he, he writes books. Good writer. Uh, and, and a good pastor. Good Bible-believing, independent Baptist preacher. And um, he wanted to do a series of articles on, online against this new independent baptist movement there's a, a, a movement uh, called the new independent baptist movement and it's a movement basically it's a contemporary m movement or whatever and he contacted me he wanted to get a handful of preachers different m missionaries and pastors that he knew uh, including himself to write an article and he assigned to each one of us a topic and uh the the topic uh, uh, uh that he assigned to me was what was whether or not this new contemporary movement was necessary why are these churches feeling the need to go this contemporary route let's change our music let's change our standards let's ch let's do everything we can to try to change the whole atmosphere of the church and basically and the reason why i'm against it is because really and truthfully it's just another effort to make the church look more like the world to try to attract the world with the world but the Bible tells us to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. We don't, we don't need the things of the world to reach the world. If the word of God is not good enough, then, then, we don't, uh, then, then, then just leave it alone. We don't need the music of the world. We don't need the methods of the world. We don't need the styles of the world. We don't need to change the message to make it more appealing. No, we just need to be faithful to the Lord and let God do the work that only God can do. But I tell you what's going on. There's a lot of young people that have grown up in our fundamentalist churches and they've gotten tired with, with the old ways and the old convictions and the old standards but in their conscience, they know that they ought to still be in church. So they want the world and they want church too. So give me both of them. And so we got a lot of churches now that are trying to appease that crowd. And there's a whole lot of emotionalism involved. And listen, I'm not against emotionalism in its proper place. I'm not against a person shedding a tear in a church service. I think we could use a little bit more, a lot more of that. I'm not against people uh, uh, getting into it and, and saying amen and a, a good hearty amen, a good hearty hallelujah and praise the Lord. We need more of that. Some of y'all need to get with it and quit being so dried up and dead. <laughs> My wife shouldn't be the loudest amener at the church. Hey, man. <laughs> That's right. I'm not against it. Look, I, everywhere I go, I try to push it. I try to promote it. I, I'm about to go preach a revival meeting. Now, you don't have to worry about it. In the Mexican churches, they know how to get with it. Oh, yeah. They'll get all into it. And I like it. I get right on into it, right along with them. There's no, listen, there's nothing wrong with having a good time in church. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's a proper way. And, and at the same time, there's a balance to everything. You know, uh, uh, all things ought to be done decently and in order. And some people go overboard with some things. But at the same time, the, you read the word of God. You read in the Psalms where, where listen, uh, there's nothing wrong with being joyful. There's nothing wrong with having a good time. There's, there's nothing wrong with, 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 with certain expressions when it's time to worship God. Listen, God is worthy to be worshipped. He's worthy to be praised. Nothing wrong with uh, getting a little emotional uh, 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 in its proper place. But I tell you what they're trying to do with this contemporary movement. They're trying to imitate 
something that only God can produce. Because let me tell you something. The problem with these modern day contemporary preachers is that they're totally powerless. Amen. Oh, and I know it. So people will accuse preachers like us of being proud and, and arrogant for the things that we say. But I'm just trying to tell you something. You want to know why I, why I fell in love with the old, what we refer to as the old time religion? Listen, I got saved out of the Catholic religion. Now, I was a little boy when I got saved. OK, but I still remember in South Bronx, New York, going to the Immaculate Conception School. I remember going to Catholic school. I remember going to mass and I remember how boring mass was. I remember how dried up and dead and formalistic and ritualistic it was. And then one day I got saved and started going to the Baptist church. This one right next door. And there was life there. And the preacher got up there. And I'll never forget the first time I saw a Baptist preacher. He walked up there, Brother Baker it was. Uh, he, it caught my attention that he wasn't wearing a dress. He's supposed to have a dress on, man. He's supposed to walk down the middle aisle with a bunch of altar boys holding up candles and, 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 a, and a big old cross and, and, a, and someone in the back holding a big old giant family-sized Bible because that's what we did at the Catholic Church. I was an altar boy. We did that. I'd hold one of them things, a candle on the side or a Bible in the back. The senior altar boy was the one that held the cross in the front. And then when we go up to the front, we'd bow uh, before the altar and do the cross thing that we did, and then we go sit off where the altar boys sit, and when I, I'd go over there and fall asleep. Until it was over with, then they woke us back up, and then we'd go grab our uh, paraphernalia and go walk the priest back down the aisle, and I made sure that Grandma saw me so she could be proud of me. That was how we, used to, that was how we did church, in the Catholic church. But then I started going to the Baptist church. And I saw preachers walking on the pews. <laughs> and I said, now this is different. <laughs> and we saw, and, and man, they would invite these wild and crazy evangelists that were nuts. They'd go up there with a nice uh, suit and tie, and they'd take it all off like they were getting ready to get in a fight with somebody. Man, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with it. I said, man, I like this. And people shouted and people said amen and people had a good time. People acted like they were really enjoyed to be in church. Man, the, the choir sang and they sang with a smile on their face. And man, we just had a good time in the Lord. I said, you know what, man? This is, uh, I like this. I fell in love with it. Amen. And you know what? To this day, I'm still in love with it. I want more of it. I want, that's what, I, I, want, I, want, I, want, I want it to be all about that in my life. Just give me some more of that. But you know what's going on? All the theatrics aside, most of all, what the preachers of old had, they had the power of God. Because when the preacher preached the Bible, Holy Ghost conviction fell. Sinners trembled. You read about that sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And the record of church history is that when Jonathan Edwards read that sermon, that the people in the, in the pews, in the audience, they were so terrified that some of the individuals were, they would stand up and they would hold on to the pillars and cling on to the pillars and beg God out loud, please God, have mercy on me and don't let me slip off into hell. Man, the preachers of old, they had such an unction about them that when they preached the word of God, the word of God had such an effect that the people could feel, it was as if they could feel the flames of hell. That's how church was. But nowadays, we've got this contemporary movement. And you know what they're trying to do? They're trying to reproduce the same effect, but with worldly means. Now listen, I'm not against using tools i've been talking with brother johnny and matthew we're talking about upgrading our equipment and brother daniel holton is an expert him and his wife in this stuff and they've been giving us some some advice and guidance in this thing and there's nothing wrong with using uh tools i mean it's nice to have light bulbs in the church 
So you can see what we're reading. It's nice to have air conditioning. It's nice to have padded pews. It's nice to have to, to record services. That way people can uh, listen to it if they want to hear it a second time. There's nothing wrong with using certain tools for the work of the Lord. But at the end of the day, you can have, the, you can have a state-of-the-art building and state-of-the-art material. But if you don't have the power of God, you've got nothing. And I tell you what the church of old had. Listen, they didn't have all that stuff. Some of the preachers of old, they had church under, under a tree. They had church uh, out in the field. But I tell you what, people would get saved left and right. You know why? Because even though they didn't have all the modern day conveniences that we have nowadays, but they had the power of God. They had an unction upon them. And that's what we need more of in our, our day and time. We need less of the world, and we, lead, we need more of the power of God. And let me, tell, let me explain something to you. When you experience the power of God in your life, you won't settle for second best. You won't want to go some contemporary route because you won't need it. Amen. We don't need rock and roll music and put Jesus' words into it. No. The, the old hymns of Zion and, 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 uh, and good music, listen, uh, it's good enough. They had unction. They had the power of God. When they prayed, the place shook. Uh, look at Acts chapter 1. You know why they had the power of God? Let me explain to you why the Christians of old had the power of God in their lives. See, nowadays in our churches, it's all about entertainment. When it becomes more about entertainment than about evangelism, you'll have less of the power of God. Because you know what the purpose of the power of God is? Look at Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. But ye shall receive, notice, power. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And notice, in the same verse, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So in this verse of scripture, Jesus tells them, I'm going to give you power. And then he tells them in the same verse, and then I'm going to tell you why I'm going to give you this power. I'm going to give you the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. I tell you what, uh, I tell you how a church will experience the power of God is when that church is more focused on evangelism than on entertainment. We're not here to entertain you, although we want you, listen, we want you to have a good time. We want you to enjoy. I love going to church. This is the highlight of my week. I love to come to church. I love to see God's people. Man, I'll show up 20, 30 minutes early just because I'm so excited to see everybody. I just can't wait to, for them to get the songs going. I can't wait to hear the piano going. I just love all of it. Man, there's nothing wrong with, with, with enjoying church. You ought to enjoy church. I tell you, if, if some of our young people would see mommy and daddy enjoying church more, they might start want, want to get a little bit more into it themselves. Amen. But when church becomes boring to mom and dad and they see mom and daddy uh, dragging their feet, oh boy, it's time for church. If we don't show up, somebody's going to notice and all this. Listen, what, that attitude uh, will affect your children. Man, I want my children to understand something. Daddy wants to be in church because he loves it. Amen. He loves it. Man, it said there in Acts chapter 2, in the original verses we read, that they had church every single day. We want the power of God in our lives, or do we really? They wanted it so bad, they showed up to church every single day. How would you feel if we announced we're going to start having church seven days a week? Now, let's just be honest. That would bother a lot of us. But the saints of old wanted it. They couldn't get enough of it. And that's why they were so powerful. When, when the best thing you can do is expose yourself to the grace of God. Put yourself in its presence. That's why you want to bring your children to church. Now listen, I emphasize that they need to receive instruction on a consistent basis at home. Because if they're only hearing it the two or three times they go to church, I don't believe that's enough. 
But at the same time, I want my children to go to church. I was so happy that they went to this youth rally. I never met this preacher, Lee Cadenhead. He called me afterwards. We had a nice conversation. But I never met him before, but I've heard so much good about him. And I heard he's, a, he's an excellent preacher. And when I heard that he was going to be preaching, I said, man, that's wonderful. I want my children under that. I want my children to go have a good time. I want them to see uh, 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 people just uh, loving being saved and loving, have a, enjoying having a good time and get us under some good Bible preaching because that's what happened to me. Man, I got under some good, uh, old-fashioned, uh, fired-up Bible preaching, and, man, it just contaminated me. It fired me up. You know why I don't have no interest in this contemporary mess? That everyone, everyone's going this contemporary route? Because, brethren, I'm still enjoying the, uh, what I experienced uh, when I got saved and started going to a Bible-believing church. Listen, it was so splendid. It was so wonderful. It was so powerful. You know what? Uh, uh, it's enough. I don't need the stuff of the world to maintain my Christianity. Listen, I just want more and need more of the power of God in my life. The churches of old, you know what they had that we need today? The power of God. We don't need more uh, worldliness. We don't need new doctrine. We don't need new theology. And we sure don't need new Bibles. We don't need a newer uh, type. Of, and listen, I'm not against uh, some things. If we're going to, you know, like I said, we're going to upgrade some, some of our equipment and all that. That's one thing. But churches are changing nowadays. And the reason why they're doing, they're trying to replicate something that only God can give, which is his power. Amen. They're trying to pump it up through worldly means, through entertainment. That's why they bring in the worldly music, because they're trying to drum up something. And it's not of God. It's not of God. We don't need more of the world. Ephesians chapter 5. God gives his power for the purpose of evangelism evangelism I'm not against you using certain methods so long as those methods line up with the Word of God Amen. giving a gospel track is a method for example it's a tool that we use holding up a scripture sign is a method we're not against methods but some people go too far with the methods and you can have all the methods you want but if you don't have the power of God your methods are absolutely worthless look at Ephesians chapter number five Verse number 18, concerning the power of God, Ephesians 5, 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That's what we need more of. That's what the, <coughs> the saints of old had. It said that they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit so much that when they prayed together, the ground shook. The earth trembled. How powerful. You know what we need more of? Uh, we, need, we need less of the world and we need Christians more fired up and filled up with the power of the Holy Spirit. But I tell you why we have Christians that are not so filled with the Holy Spirit. Because they're filled with other junk. That's right. My brethren, you need to be careful. Again, I, I, this thing about technology keeps, bringing, keeps coming up. So let's just go ahead and beat a dead horse while we're at it. But be careful with, with, the, with the cell phones and the tablets and the computers. We tend to, it's so easy to go down that rabbit hole and entertain our, entertain our minds with, you know, uh, check out the guy on the skateboard, watch him fall and bust his head. That's so funny. And it is. But we'll fill our minds with, 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 with a whole hour of watching all these bloopers and failures and all this kind of crazy stuff. And, and it's funny and I'm not against us laughing and having a good time. But isn't it something that we can, we can sit there and watch a whole bunch of uh, senseless and worthless and unprofitable videos for an hour. But yet it's such a struggle to read the Bible for 15 minutes. And it's such a struggle to stay on your knees and pray and just concentrate to pray for 10 minutes straight. If we don't pop in a commercial, <laughs> we're, we're programmed. If I don't get a commercial, I won't be able to make it another 10 minutes. We've been programmed. And I tell you, that's a lot of the reason why we have such powerless, weak, anemic Christians nowadays. Because we filled ourselves with a bunch of junk, with a bunch of garbage that don't amount to nothing. And we don't read our Bibles and we don't pray. I'm telling you, I'll never forget 
I went to a revival meeting. There was a preacher there. He'd been in the ministry for over 40-something years at the time, and uh, now he, he's still in the ministry. It's been over 60 now, and he's still alive. His name is Don Green. And I went up to the preacher. I was going to Bible Institute, Buford Bible Institute, and I went to this revival meeting to hear him preach with some of the brethren from here. And after the church service was over with, I said, I'm going to go approach that pastor, and I want to ask him for some advice. And so I went to Brother Green, and I asked him, I said, Brother, what is the best advice that you can give a young preacher? What's the best advice? This was like 20 years ago, 20 something years ago. I said, what's the best advice you can give somebody like me? And he said, Brother Manny, if you want to be the best preacher you could possibly be, two things you need to do. You need to read your Bible every day. And number two, you need to pray every day. And if you do those two things, You'll be the best Christian, the best preacher, the best father and husband you could possibly be. And when he said that, I was disappointed. I said, I want my money back. I could have told him that. Who doesn't know to read your Bible and pray every day? But let's just be honest. How many of us are reading our Bibles and praying every single day? Look at how hard it is. Because the flesh is contrary to the spirit of God. But I'm telling you, if you'll do it, God will fill you. As you read that Bible, and as you pray, and as you meditate on the things of God, and on the word of God, God will begin to saturate your mind. As you saturate your mind with the scriptures, and saturate with your heart. Listen, the more you saturate, saturate your, your mind, and your heart, and your soul with the things of the Lord, the less room you're going to have for all the garbage that, will, that doesn't amount to a hill of beans that will do nothing but zap the power of God out of your life. You say, what do you do? What do we need to do to be more filled with the Holy Spirit? Let's saturate ourselves. You need to saturate yourself with the Word of God and with prayer. That's why you ought to do it on a consistent basis. The Christians of old, you know what they had? They had an unction of the Lord. You know what else they had? Look at Acts chapter 2. I, I, we got to go. Acts chapter 2. What did the church of old have that we need today? So that we can have an impact in our community, in our day and time. Acts chapter number 2, look at verse number 44. And all that believed, notice, were together and had all things common. Look at verse 46. And they continuing daily with one accord. Notice, one accord in the temple and breaking bread. Notice, from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. You know what the church of old had that we need more of today? They had unity. They had unction, and they also had unity. Unity. If the devil can be successful in dividing the church, he'll succeed in making that church absolutely and utterly worthless. Divide and conquer is the old military tactic. Napoleon Bonaparte, was the one who specialized in the tactic that is known as the military tactic that is known as divide and conquer. He had a tactic where they would use, they would shoot cannons back in those days. And what he would do is he would instruct his men to fill those cannons up with rock, rocks, uh, nails, uh, chunks of metal, you know, uh, anything like that. Uh, they would just stuff it in there. And the only purpose was, because back in those days when they would fight, they would form those lines in an organized fashion. So they, he called this, give them a whiff of grape shot. A whiff of grape shot. And all grape shot was, was to fill up the cannon with a bunch of nails and rocks and glass and, and anything like that. And they would shoot it with the only purpose of just dividing the line. Because if they could divide the lines, then it would be easier. They could weaken their opponent. And that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to shoot us with a whiff of grape shot. So he'll shoot a little bit of worldliness over here. And he'll shoot a little bit of false doctrine over there. And he'll shoot a little bit of worldly entertainment over there. And he'll shoot a little bit of bitterness over there. And a little bit of jealousy over there. And a little bit of pride. And he'll shoot all kinds of temptations just to get us to divide up. And that's how he weakens the church. Look at 1 Corinthians. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse number 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all, notice, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye perfect, be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. That's why I don't like cliques. I don't like cliques in the church. Listen, you see someone uh, off, I'm trying to teach our young people, my, my children, the same thing. Listen, uh, uh, you see a young person that's off and, and, and doing their own thing or whatever. Maybe they're a little bit shy or a little bit nervous uh, uh, because they don't uh, recognize or know everybody. Listen, uh, you be a leader. Be a good leader and take the initiative to go and, and friend that, be a friend to that person. Invite them to come sit with you. Listen, when, when, when people come to church, when visitors come to church, go and greet that person. Don't be a snob. <laughs> go and greet that person shake their hands uh, and, and hug their necks and let them know that man we're happy to have you and then when you see brethren that are, that are off and, and doing their own thing listen uh, let them know that let's be careful why don't you come on over here and let's have some fellowship man Amen. unity unity the devil wants to bust it all up the devil wants to bust the church of, of Jesus Christ all up and usually it's over stupid stuff so-and-so didn't shake my hand. When the preacher preached, he looked right at me. <laughs> yeah, and it's silly stuff. Man, grow up. <laughs> Quit acting like a bunch of carnal little babies and grow up. Man, listen, let's fellowship with one another. Let's get on the same page. Let's be unified so that God can do a work through us. God can't work when everybody's all divided up, man. We don't need clicks in the church, and I don't know if there's, any, if there's anything like that going on, but if there's not, stop it. If there is, stop it. Amen. Right now. <laughs> yeah, division. You know what the church of old had? They had all things in common. They were unified. Look at Philippians chapter 1. They were unified. You want to... You want the church to have a great impact in its community? See what you can do to help contribute to the body of Christ. Every one of you is important. Everybody is important. Everyone, that bring, everyone brings something to the table. Now, not everyone can do the same thing. But everybody can do something that will be a blessing to the body of Christ. And when the whole body is working together and functioning together as one unit, God blesses that thing. It pleases the Lord how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. It pleases God. And when God is pleased, he blesses. When you're pleased with your children, you want to take them out for ice cream. You want to buy them something for their birthday. You want to do something just to let them know just how pleased you are with them. And listen, when God sees the church working together, for the common cause of glorifying Jesus Christ and seeing sinners saved and worshiping the Lord and growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ. God is so happy about that. He's so pleased. He blesses the church. And we need more of the blessings of God. Amen. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh. The gospel of Christ. I like the way it reads in the Spanish Bible. It, it says, become it, digno. Uh, are you walking worthy of the gospel of Christ? In other words, you need to live in a way that's worthy of the gospel that saved you. Amen. That's what it's saying. Let your conversation uh, be a, as only that which becometh the gospel of Christ. When you misbehave, that's not becoming of the gospel of Christ that saved your soul. Amen. When, you don't, when you talk in a way that, that is... That is, that is, that is uh, uh, that is arrogant or you talk in a way that is filthy or you talk in a way that doesn't please God it's not becoming of the gospel of Jesus Christ Amen. you ought to walk and you ought to talk and you ought to act and you ought to behave yourself in a way that's worthy of the gospel of Christ so that the people around you will see you and recognize that you know what that's a Christian right there that's right 
You'll never make an impact upon uh, the lives of others without that type of testimony. Look at Philippians 1, 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast, notice, in one spirit and with one mind. Notice, striving together. Man, we're in this thing together, my brethren. Fight the good fight of faith. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Listen, we know it's hard. There's challenges out there. There's challenges. There's, there's obstacles. There's trials and there's temptations. But my brethren, when we work together as the church, as a unified unit for the glory of God, God blesses us and God strengthens us and gives us everything that we need to succeed and bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus Christ. He says, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel and in nothing, notice, in nothing terrified. In other words, don't be intimidated by this world. Man, when, when the church is working together as the gates of hell are attacking it, let me tell you what the devil is intimidated by. He's intimidated by a unified church. The church intimidates the forces of hell when it works together. And he says, in nothing terrified by your adversaries, the church is going to have adversaries. You're going to have, if you try to serve the Lord, I don't care what you do, and the Lord knows I try, I try to get along with everybody, I try to be as friendly as I can, uh, uh, then, but you, if you intend to preach the Bible by simply telling people what the Bible says, I don't care if you do it with, a, with the biggest smile on your face and with honey dripping down your lips, somebody is still going to get mad. Because eventually, as we go verse by verse, you're going to get to certain verses that's going to hit somebody. Eventually, you're going to get to the verse, unless you're going to skip over things. But if you're going to give the whole counsel of God, eventually you're going to get to the verse that says, fornication is a sin. Well, who told him that I was sleeping around? Eventually, you're going to get to the verse that says that adultery is a sin. Well, who told the, who, who told the preacher? Hey, did he see my text on the cell phone? <laughs> my wife told on me. My husband told on me. No, maybe the Holy Spirit did. And he don't even know it. But God's got your number. Amen. Eventually, you're going to get on that lying. Eventually, you're going to get on dishonesty. Eventually, you're going to get on pride and anger, having a bad temper. Eventually, you're going to get on bitterness. Eventually, as you preach the word of God, you're going to hit a subject and somebody's going to be guilty of it. You can't please everybody. I've, I've accepted a long time ago, I'm never going to be able to please everybody because I'm not ice cream. If you want to just be good with everybody and never make anyone accept and you just want everybody to always be happy with you, be ice cream. The problem is God didn't call me to be that. He called me to preach. And so if you preach that book, you're going to have adversaries whether you like it or not. But you must be faithful. He says, uh, uh, in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Notice, the Christians of old, you know what they had that we need more of today? They were unified around a common cause to earnestly contend for the faith. This is our team. That's right. This is our team. And listen, I'm a team player. And I, I want everyone involved. You know, I don't want anybody to be just a glorified bench warmer. I want everyone to get in the game eventually. Now, we may, we may have our starting team and let the starters do their thing, but eventually I want everyone to contribute something. Because if we win, we need to win together. Amen. Unity, unity. But then let me give you this last one and I'm done for tonight. Uh, look at Acts chapter 1. Now, I'm going to give you some Manny Rodriguez theology. And it may, it may be completely heretical. But I'm going to give you something to chew on. But in Acts chapter number 1, <clears throat> look at verse number 6. The Lord has risen again already, and he's about to ascend on high. He's about to go back to heaven. 
And he says in Acts chapter 1, verse number 6, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? See, that's what the disciples wanted all along. They didn't understand what Isaiah 53 and all the other verses, Psalms 22, was prophesying about. They didn't understand the, the part about Jesus Christ being a suffering Savior. They read all them verses uh, about Jesus Christ being their future king, and that's what they wanted. They wanted the kingdom. They wanted the kingdom. But they didn't want a suffering Savior. And that's why they were offended and even confused when the Lord was, was, was going through what he went through, and then he got crucified. They didn't understand all that. They didn't understand all that. And so uh, now the Lord has risen again from the dead. And so as the Lord has risen again, he's about to go back, and they're, they're asking a question. Is now the time? Now are you going to settle the kingdom? Because, man, the whole time we were walking with you all over the place, and you were doing all these signs and wonders, we, we thought for sure you was about to, uh, to uh, establish the kingdom. And then when you rode into Jerusalem on that donkey, and, 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 and everyone was ready to coronate you, uh, man, I thought for sure, we thought for sure you was about to establish the kingdom, but it didn't work out. You ended up getting crucified, but you're back. You've risen again. Now are you going to do it? And then the Lord says, look at verse number 7. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the, or the seasons which the Father hath put in his power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. So notice, here's what I believe. They asked Jesus a question. They said, Lord, are you now going to establish the kingdom? And he said, it's almost as if the Lord, he didn't really give them a direct answer. He said, don't you worry about the times or the seasons. Well, that could mean anything. That could mean he's going to establish it in the next five minutes. That could mean he's going to establish it in five years. That could mean he's going to establish it in 55 years from now. But he didn't give them a time frame. He said, don't you worry about the time frame. It's not given to you to know the times and the seasons. So what was the Lord's answer? He says, listen, don't you worry about that. What I want you to concentrate on is this. I'm going to give you power so that you can be a witness of me to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and everybody else. So here's what I think. I believe those disciples interpreted that to me. Okay, the way he answered our question is, don't worry about the timing. Go out there and preach Jesus Christ to everybody. I believe they interpreted that to me. That if we can preach the gospel to everyone like, it, like, the, like, like the great commission that he gave us to do back in Mark 16, if we'll do our job in witnessing and getting people saved, just maybe if we can convert all of Jerusalem and all of the Jews, the Lord will come back and establish his kingdom. That's just Manny Rodriguez's theory. Because when you read the book of Acts, you'll find that man, they went everywhere, Even they were even willing to suffer persecution. They didn't care. I believe that they really thought that they were on a mission that if we could get everybody saved. I, I believe this. This is what I think. I think when they saw 3,000 people get saved on the day of Pentecost, I think they were disappointed. That's what I think. Because I believe their goal was to see everybody get saved. I believe when they saw 3,000, they said to themselves, now that's a good start, but that's not good enough. We see that, and we're amazed. That's mind-boggling to us. I believe they saw that, and I'm sure they rejoiced because they did rejoice. But I believe in their hearts they said, but that's not good enough. If we can get every Jew in Jerusalem to get saved, the Lord will come back and establish his kingdom. Because you know what Romans chapter 11 tells us? It tells us that one day all of Israel shall be saved. Oh, yeah. In the tribulation period, when the Antichrist shows up, he's going to persecute those Jews. He's going to be killing Jews left and right. And then he's going to gather all the nations of the world together to gather to one place outside of Jerusalem. They're going to surround Jerusalem. And the Antichrist is going to send armies off to Jordan where so many Jews are going to be hiding in the rock cities, in the mountain cities of Jordan. And then he's going to get the remaining ones in Jerusalem and invade Jerusalem. You read about that in the book of Zechariah, chapter 12 and 13. And when the Antichrist gathers all them armies together, what's he doing it for? For the single purpose of eliminating Israel. 
Why? Why does the devil want to eliminate Israel? Anti-Semitism is inspired by Satan. Why? Why is that so? The, because the devil, the devil knows the Bible too. <laughs> he knows that the Lord intends to return to this earth one day and establish his kingdom. And he knows that he intends to rule over the earth from Israel, from Jerusalem, and establish his throne right there in Jerusalem. Well, how's he going to do that if there's no Israel left? So that's why the devil wants to kill off. That's why the devil raised up men like Hitler. That's why the devil raises up uh, Hezbollah and, and all these different groups, the Al-Qaeda and ISIS and all these different groups. Uh, all this anti-Semitism is inspired by Satan for the single purpose of eliminating Israel. That's why you can't reason with a bunch of terrorists. These politicians are nuts thinking that they're going to reason with these guys. Them guys are never going to be satisfied until there's not one Jew left standing. That's the way it's always been ever since the time of Esau and the Edomites. And that's the way it's going to be until Jesus shows up. And right when, in, when, when, when Jerusalem is surrounded by the enemy, oh, my brethren, the Bible says Jesus Christ. He's going to be coming, like the Bible says in Isaiah, like birds flying. They're going to see him with his army behind them, us. <laughs> in glorified bodies, with glorified swords, riding glorified horses. And we're going to come with the Lord, and we're going to travel all the way from Mount Sinai all the way to the Mount of Olives. And the Bible says in Joel chapter 2 that he, the Lord, uh, there's going to be a path all the way from Mount Sinai all the way to the Mount of Olives. You know what the Mount of Olives is? The Mount of Olives is, north, is east of Jerusalem. And in the northeastern part of Jerusalem is where the temple is that sits on a mount. So you have a mount here in Jerusalem where the temple is going to be. And then across the way is the Mount of Olives. And in between those two mounts, two, two mounts is a big valley, the Valley of Megiddo. And that's where the Battle of Armageddon is going to take place. And you know what? Can you imagine the desperation of the Jews when they see this massive army. The Bible says 200 million demons are going to come out of the, uh, out of the pits of hell in, in Revelation uh, chapter number 9. I believe that those uh, demonic forces are, are part of the Antichrist's army that he's going to form. Plus all the armies of the rest of the world, of every nation. Can you imagine how desperate the Jews are going to be when they see this massive army like never before brought together for the single purpose of eliminating Israel and every Jew. Can you imagine how many prayers are going to go up in that moment when they see themselves surrounded, crying out to God, Oh God, save us, please. There's no hope left. How in the world are we going to be able to deal with such a massive army? Lord, save us. And in that moment, the Lord is going to show up with a glorified army. And the Bible says he's going to step foot on the Mount of Olives. And the Lord's very presence alone, as soon as he steps foot on the Mount of Olives, is going to split the Mount of Olives in two. God's pre Jesus Christ's presence alone is going to be so powerful, it's going to cause the whole earth to tremble, which to, by, by which the Mount of Olives will split in two, according to Zechariah chapter 13. And the Lord, is going to deliver the Jews and they're going to see the marks in his hand and they're going to recognize, you know what? Who is this man? We've been begging God to save us. Who is this man on this white horse? He's destroying enemies in this whole path. All the way from Mount Sinai, all the way to Mount, the Mount of Olives. And they're going to see nail prints in their hand. And in that moment is when they're going to realize that's Jesus Christ. Then Baptist preachers, were, they were right. We really did crucify our Lord. And the Bible says there's going to be weeping in Jerusalem like never before. And it's going, to, it's going to result in repentance like never before. And according to Romans chapter 11, verse 25 to 27, the Bible says all of Israel shall be saved. Now today, individuals get saved. But when the Lord comes back, that'll be the first time that an entire nation 
without exception, get saved. Every Jew is going to get saved, according to Romans chapter 11. So here's what I think. I believe that the disciples in their time thought that if we can get everybody saved, we can convince the Lord to come back and establish the kingdom. Here's my final point. You know what the church of old had that we need today? They had an urgency. You know why they turned the world upside down and preached the gospel like a madman? Trying to convert everyone. You know what the, the enemies of the disciples said? They said that these, these men, these Christians, they have filled Jerusalem with their doctrine. They just flooded the place with their doctrine. And it's making us look bad. That's what we need. We need a church so fired up that the Christians just flood their communities, their county, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just saturate our town with the Bible, with the word of God, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just saturate the place with gospel tracts, holding up scripture signs, witnessing to everybody that you can, and inviting folks out to church, and just doing anything that you can to promote the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel. My brethren, I'm telling you, if the church will do that, God will bless the church with the same power that drove, drove the disciples of old. Let's all stand. Good to be in church today, right? Man, I've enjoyed it. Good to see, have the Holton family with us. Pray for them as they head back to Brunswick and uh, pray that they come back whenever they, you guys get a chance. Uh, you're always welcome here. We're home, you're home away from home. Amen. All right.